actually approved. And uh, we have a wonderful program today. This week marks the time when we uh, come together to celebrate um, the end of uh, Black History Month and Women's History Month uh, and its beginnings. And while many of us celebrate Black history and women's history um, for over a month span of time, this moment of crossover, I think, is important when we nationally recognize the contributions of Black women. And we are so delighted to be joined by some amazing panelists. And our panel discussion is entitled Preserving Our History, Preparing for Our Future. And I think this is perfectly timed as uh, at the end of last week, President Biden announced his nomination of Judge Brown Jackson as an Associate Justice of the United States Supreme Court. Judge Jackson will be only the sixth woman, the third black person, and of course, the first black woman to serve on our country's highest court. In her remarks, Judge Jackson noted that she stood on the shoulders of Connecticut's own Judge Constance Baker Motley, the first black woman appointed as a federal court judge by President Lyndon B. Johnson. And that appointment happened 55 years ago. And I think it's interesting. I read that both Judge Jackson and, Cons and Judge Constance Baker Motley shared the same birth date. So uh, it's very exciting. And uh, we are excited about the prospect of her confirmation. And it's another reminder as to why both educating our young people and being intentional about our path forward are really important parts of our mission to advance equity. And so I couldn't be more excited to be here today to sit with black women leaders in our own state who collectively represent the field of education from early childhood through graduate level studies. The governor and I know that education is key to representation and inclusivity. And it's a priority for us that Connecticut continue to be one of the leading states in the nation uh, in terms of quality education and equitable access to education. Um, and we recognize that this requires listening to the perspectives of all of our communities to ensure that none of our residents are left behind. So I thank each of our panelists for joining us today and I can't wait to hear from each of you. First, I'm happy to introduce my co-moderator for today, State Department of Education Commissioner, Charlene Russell Tucker. She's been serving as our uh, leader of the State Department of Education and has been uh, working in that department for more than 20 years in several capacities, including Deputy Commissioner and Acting Commissioner. When Governor Lamont announced his nomination as, of her as Commissioner last August, it was clear that there was no one better equipped uh, to be our Commissioner to and to address the needs of our K through 12 students. So. We are thrilled to have her here for this very important discussion. And uh, Commissioner, I was hoping that you could say a few words of welcome and tell us about the incredible panelists that we have. And I love that they're all wearing different primary colors. They're <laughs> very vibrant. Thank you so much, uh, Lieutenant Governor, and good afternoon, panelists and our guests who are joining us today. It is my pleasure to be here today co-moderating this discussion of distinguished leaders in education, preserving our history, preparing for our future. And as the Lieutenant Governor mentioned, I'm honored to be leading K-12 education in our state, committed to empowering all our students for success. 
we work daily to ensure the supports and resources are in place uh, so that all our students can thrive. And I always like to begin by saying I acknowledge and embrace and value the diversity of our student body here in Connecticut and wanted to be begin by sharing just a few data points uh, as we discuss preparing our future. With over half a million students in our schools, there are 50% who are non-white, 43% who are eligible for free and reduced price meals, 16% are students with disabilities, 8% are English learners with more than 145 spoken languages, and across our student body, over 180 language spoken. This is our Connecticut K-12 education landscape. So with that, I'm excited to introduce today's panelists. First, we begin with Ebony Nelson, his Dean and Professor at UConn's School of Law. Before coming to us after decorated teaching history at the University of South Carolina, Dean Nelson practiced employee benefits law and her scholarship focusing on education law and policy has been published in numerous journals. She has a long history demonstrating her commitment to public service and advocacy, serving on numerous boards, and being recognized as one of the 100 most influential Blacks in Connecticut by the State Conference of the NAACP. Thank you for joining us, Dean Nelson. We're also delighted to have with us today Dr. Tracy Espy, president of Mitchell College. President Espy's resume details her commitment to serving diverse populations from her current service on the Governor's Workforce Council to her appointment to the Network for Vocation and Undergraduate Education Advisory Committee of the Council of Independent Colleges and Universities. Through these efforts and many more, President Espy showcases her commitment to engaging students and communities to improve outcomes for all. Welcome President Espy to our panel today. Next, I'm glad to introduce Cheryl Devonish the Chief Executive Officer of Norwalk Community College. CEO Devonich's background in both law and education have led her to a variety of roles at NCC, from adjunct professor, professor to Chief Diversity and Equity Officer to Chief Operating Officer. Through academic, professional, and volunteer work, CEO Devonish remains committed to issues of equity, social justice, and partnership with community organizations to advance diversity and inclusion. Thank you for joining us, CEO Devanish. Looking forward to hearing from you today. And last but not least, I have the pleasure to introduce Rochelle Smith, Associate Dean of Diversity and Inclusion and Associate Chief Diversity Officer at the Yale School of Medicine. Associate Dean Smith comes to us all the way from Washington uh, where she founded the Washington University Diversity Pipeline Consortium for STEM. With, with her, she brings to our great state more than 20 years of experience working at the national, institutional, and departmental levels to design, implement, and maintain successful academic pipeline programs for those underrepresented in STEM fields. We're so glad to have you here, Associate Dean Smith, and thank you all for being with us today and look forward to a great conversation together. Thank you, Lieutenant Governor. Thank you so much, uh, Commissioner. And we are going to start with Dean Nelson from the UConn Law School. And if you're wondering what that beautiful building is behind her, it is not the Wadsworth Athenaeum. It is the University of Connecticut Law School. And uh, Dean Nelson, our legal system really is at the core of both gender and racial equity. So tell us what you think the role is of the law school and the law school community in preserving our history and bringing forward landmark cases that have changed history and our society. Yes, well, thank you so much. It is wonderful to be with you. Thank you so much, Lieutenant Governor and Commissioner and my wonderfully esteemed uh, co-panelists. It's really an honor to be with you all today in this historic moment that we are in. And so I thank Lieutenant Governor for recognizing that with the uh, nomination of our first African-American Supreme Court Justice. And her nomination really speaks to this question, Lieutenant Governor. When you think about the role that law has played in both opening doors and closing doors to, of opportunity. 
when it comes to students of color, when it comes to women, when it comes to a whole host of different um, types of groups. And so the law plays a critical role in expanding access. Indeed, we are all able to sit here today um, and serve on the panel because of laws and cases like Brown v. Board of Education that overturns uh, Plessy versus Ferguson and this idea of um, separate is equal. Brown showing that separate is inherently unequal and that we have to have those schoolhouse doors open. It's important for us to think about that when Brown was decided, there were a host of cases that were decided before Brown in the higher education context, opening the college doors and the university doors um, that Constance Baker Motley, Judge Motley was integrally involved in with the NAACP. And so the law really helps us to live our best selves as a society. It can help us to provide those educational opportunities that serves as gateways for success for our children at the K through 12 level, as well as the higher education level, and making sure that those opportunities are provided on an equitable basis, whether again, that's race, gender, sexual orientation, religion, in any manner that is constitutional. But it's important to know the limits of the law. You can have all of the laws on the books to increase access and opportunity. But if those of us who are on the ground employing those laws and carrying out those laws, if we are not um, willing to really see that to its fullest extent, then we'll continue to see the educational opportunities and the disparities that we see now. So we can have a case like Chef D. O'Neill, which is so important, groundbreaking here in Connecticut. But again, if we do not have people on the ground that allows for that inter-district um, you know, transferability, that allows for those schoolhouse doors to be wide open to as many people as possible, the law itself will only go so far. Uh, Dean, thank you so much. I'll just say this, I finished reading The Civil Rights Queen, which is a biography of Constance Baker Motley. And the beginning of her story really starts in New Haven and education is at the core of it because she was at the Q House in New Haven when uh, one of the New Haven supporters of the Q House um, heard her speak, saw leadership and uh, brilliance in her and ended up paying for her college education and later her law school education, something that was probably beyond, way beyond the reach of her parents to do for her. So um, Connecticut has been a chief part in, in this um, story of uh, women achieving in uh, our court system. Um, so thank you so much, Commissioner Russell Tucker. I'm gonna let you ask the next question. Thank you, Lieutenant Governor, and thank you, uh, Dean Nelson. Uh, I took away from that really education being a gateway of success, uh, something that I'm going to hold on to. So thank you. So CEO Dubanish, uh, you're up next. I wonder if you can tell us about your students' interest in the history of gender and racial equity, including its relevance in current events, and, and what kind of resources and opportunities are available to them at NCC and and otherwise in the Connecticut State College and University system. Absolutely, Commissioner Russell Tucker. And I have to echo Dean Nelson's sentiment. It is really an honor and a privilege um, to really sit on this panel with such esteemed um, panelists. Um, you know, I think that there is a great deal of student interest surrounding not only racial and gender equity, but social justice across the board. Um, and I think really to understand that is to, it may be helpful um, if I share like a little bit of snapshot in terms of who, you know, our students are. Uh, we have an amazingly diverse student population. Our students come from over 87 countries. They speak over 54 languages. 42% um, of our students are first generation. 69% um, of those students identify as non-white. 
40% are Hispanic and 60% of our students are women. Um, and so, you know, one of the things that uh, really stood out to me recently about our student population um, was also that our students are working over 30 hours a week in addition to attending class um, because they are, you know, required to contribute to household expenses. Um, sometimes they're the sole caregiver for children, parents, siblings. And, you know, as we saw the pandemic beginning to unfold, one of the things that really um, stood out to me was, you know, our students were out there on the front line um, and in a variety of ways. Uh, they were in essential um, working positions. So that could be uh, working in the supermarket stores that had to remain open, but also out in healthcare facilities. You know, our students were out there um, participating and making sure that tests were available and COVID tests were done, but also distributing the COVID-19 vaccine. Um, and so, you know, I think that our students, uh, just because of the communities that they represent, um, they know firsthand um, about some of the um, disparities and the equity gaps that exist, I think not only in education, but also in terms of representation in the workforce. Um, so this is very personal to our students uh, because it hits them directly, um, or oftentimes they're seeing it in their communities, it's hitting their families. Um, and oftentimes if you speak to a community college student about why they decided to continue their education and pursue a degree at NCC or transfer going to the workforce, is oftentimes connected to social mobility for their families because they have seen um, kind of the impact of what happens when uh, we are not as a community building generational wealth. Um, and so these issues are very, you know, near and dear to our students. Again, it's very, the work is very personal to them. Um, at the college, you know, there are a variety of ways that students kind of engage in this work. Um, some of it happens in our student groups and our student organization. Uh, we're very proud of our UN model um, student group um, that has had the opportunity to go to Washington, D.C. Um, and, and really learn about global social justice issues. Um, but not only that, just in terms of some of the additional kind of academic um, and student support services that we offer here and making sure that we are always kind of pursuing it through an equity lens um, and really targeting uh, those at promised populations. And so I, I use that term because I think oftentimes um, when we're talking about issues of equity and social justice. We have a tendency to come to the work um, through a deficit lens. Um, and we wanna make sure that we don't do that um, today, but certainly as we continue these conversations. And so we are really talking about communities and students that um, there is such a great deal of promise that exists. Um, and the work that lies ahead is really just tackling those, those barriers collectively. That's, Thank you. That's great. No, thank you, Lieutenant Governor. I just wanted to underscore the students at promise versus referring to them as student at risk. So thank you very much for putting that in this conversation today, Lieutenant Governor. That's right up there with education as a, as a gateway for success. I'm writing all of these really great <laughs> phrases down. Um, and thank you so much, um, CEO Devonish, President Espy, Mitchell College, strives to support a very diverse student body. And I'll say that my nephew is a graduate of uh, your college. And what I love about it is the um, ability model that highlights seven specific abilities, including one that's called diversity and global perspectives. So tell us about how your teaching prepares your students for success and for the workforce. Great, well, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you so much, Lieutenant Governor and Commissioner uh, Russell Tucker, Tucker and everybody else that's on this esteemed committee. I'm happy to be here and speak a little bit about Mitchell College. Well, first of all, I just wanna put in context the focus of Mitchell College. I mean, we really believe as an independent college of higher education uh, in educating a, a kaleidoscope of learners. I mean, you know, especially the, the idea of celebrating and honoring students with varying identities, abilities, and learning styles that really help us to ensure that each student is prepared to discover their passion and path in life. So by nature, 
um, our commitment is to an inclusive education um, that really focuses on um, valuing diversity and global perspective. You know, one of the things about ability is about giving students the, the uh, option and knowledge on how to flex and be able to adapt into to society, no matter really what, um, what they tend to deal with while they're here and certainly upon graduation. So when I think about how we define the um, ability on diversity and global perspective, it really is about being able to interpret today's world as a socially and culturally diverse environment, helping students learn about the ability uh, to understand how world cultures share opinions, treat issues of race, class, and gender, identity levels or interdependence among you know, different economies, political, cultural, and environmental models of human relations. At Mitchell, uh, our faculty do a wonderful job of helping our students focus on some of the areas I'm gonna mention as it relates to their outcomes of learning. So if you think about things that are so important for preparing people in society today, things about students having the knowledge about the willingness to appreciate cultural differences, you know, being able to identify and understand their own cultural norms and beliefs and then how that gets played out knowing their biases and understanding the significance of that. Uh, being able to demonstrate an understanding of cultural worldview frameworks you know, we are increasingly in a more global and diverse uh, society and preparing students um, in the classroom work with an understanding of the various contexts upon which we live in is critical. And then I think also uh, preparing our students being able to analyze communication within cultures. You know, coursework goes across the gamuts, whether it's uh, papers, projects, and various learning measurements to achieve these outcomes. When I think about what's really, really important we're educating young people uh, to adapt to society and the growing changes uh, in society. We just think about for a second, I know Duluth and Tush has done many, many great white papers as I'm sure all of us have read, but I find what's most interesting is when, when one of their papers sort of talk about this idea that the uh, immigration, which we already know patterns in society have been changing since the 1960s. And that includes, you know, even when women began to get into the workforce, um, so even now that we're seeing an even more diverse workforce than ever, this workforce is changing gradually. There are now more women. There are now more people uh, of uh, higher ages, you know, beyond the millennial generation. So we have to really be able to prepare young people for a much more uh, fastly evolving uh, culture and society and being able to give them the knowledge uh, as much as we can so they can understand it, you know, even understand the diversity that we see but I always like to punctuate unseen diversity, things that we don't even see by the natural eye. And then also thinking about the future, the other characteristics of diversity and even beyond and global perspectives that we don't even know today. So at Mitchell College, you know, our number one goal is to making sure that our students are best prepared in the knowledge and skills to adapt to society regardless of what's changing. And that's what we're doing uh, with this ability of diversity and global perspective. That's great. Uh, thank you, President Hesby. Associate Dean Smith, advancing women and students of color in STEM fields is a priority for the Governor's Council and Women and Girls. I know, Lieutenant Governor, you have championed these efforts aimed directly at engaging students, especially girls and young women of color in STEM. And for those in our audience, the Lieutenant Governor's Computing Challenge is actively underway right now, doing my little ad here. Uh, last year's challenge was quite a success and it was amazing to see what the students produced. And I know I'm not the only one looking forward to this year's submissions. And so I'm also very pleased we're gonna to talk to you, uh, Associate Dean Smith about your role. I'm pleased to share uh, that thanks to intentional efforts of our agency staff and stakeholders, the racial ethnic composition of the teaching core in Connecticut is also changing. The percentage of non-white educators has increased from 8.1%, about you know, 4,300 educators in Connecticut in 14-15 to 10% uh, in 2021, uh, the addition of over 1,000 uh, educators. There's much work to be done and we're actively working to continue this forward momentum. However, speaking of recruitment, Associate Dean Smith, part of your role as Associate Dean of Diversity and Inclusion and Associate Chief Diversity Officer at Yale School of Medicine is to develop recruitment and retention programs aimed at graduate students. Tell us about some of your programs and initiatives and feel free to share some of your success stories 
from your previous experience at Washington University. Well, thank you so very much. I'm so honored to be here. Thank you, Commissioner and Lieutenant Governor and Sharif Phoenix Sharp for inviting me and um, so honored to be with this panel. Um, so, you know, in STEM or science, technology, engineering and mathematics, so much of it is based on an apprentice model, meaning uh, there's one who learns something and then that one who learns something then goes to teach it or um, mentor it, you know, to another. So um, if you think about historically who's been excluded from those um, uh, careers and from those professional experiences, um, it really does speak to, you know, the difficulty um, as we all on this panel um, know it to be to, to um, you know, open up the pathway and the pipeline for individuals who have been historically excluded and histor historically underrepresented from those careers to get through. So uh, one of, you know, sort of the tenets um, of the work that I do is to, um, develop proxy um, or surrogate experiences for those hours around the dinner table, you know, talking about these careers that some have never gotten, um, you know, pro providing experiences for them to feel like they belong um, into a career. You know, it goes a long way to tell somebody who you know they are from a background, whether it's their first generation college or they are from a limited income background or they are a person of color or a woman, et cetera, et cetera, queer, living with a disability that, hey, I see you in this career. I know that you would do great in this career. That goes a long way. That stays with someone. So um, the efforts and initiatives that uh, I've been involved with has really had that theme uh, run through them. It's been dozens and dozens, but I'll just talk about a couple here. Um, one uh, for in terms of graduate students is um, inviting uh, HBCU students to um, our institutions, you know, to really take a deep dive um, into what, what does it mean to be a scientist? What does it mean to be a doctor? What does it mean to be a physician assistant, et cetera. Um, and then also bringing in their advisors, um, their undergraduate or high school advisors, um, because we know that those individuals see hundreds of students throughout their career. And, you know, so it's not just the students that we're targeting and uh, wanting to serenade, if you will. Um, it's those advisors that mean so much to them and that they trust and those advisors want to know that they can trust us as institutions to have their students handed off to us to help them um, throughout their careers. Uh, over the time that I've been doing this at two uh, institutions like um, Commissioner Russell Tucker uh, mentioned at Washington University in St. Louis and now at Yale, um, Earlier in my career, my summer research programs involved the parents. So we would bring in undergrads to do 10 weeks of uh, summer research. We would pay them because you have to buy students typically out of their jobs, any job that they would get over the summer, we'd bring them in. And then at the culminating event, we would bring in their parents. Uh, to um, witness their students speaking in a way that they had never heard them speak uh, on topics that they had never heard them uh, talk about, you know, this research thing. And we also had um, workshops and modules for the parents and the siblings of these students to talk about what does it mean for your child to go through this career and how can you help? So um, uh, we also have, affin I've also been a part of starting affinity groups because 
there's this delicate balance when you have individuals from historically underrepresented backgrounds going into historically um, and predominantly white institutions. Um, sometimes there's a culture shock. The climate is not always um, warm, you know, given your best efforts. And, um, you know, just bringing them in to have that affinity experience um, sometimes can help them go on in their um, career training. Um, I also want to talk about uh, outreach to high school students. I've been involved with the Young Scientist Program in St. Louis, whereby graduate students um, would reach out to the teachers and high school students and bring them in to do research over eight weeks, pay them, give them transportation, and then they themselves would do um, a research talk at the end. But um, it's just so many things that we can do um, that uh, need to be done. We, it's all hands on deck. Um, so we really have to involve, you know, not only the students themselves, but, um, you know, their advisors, their mentors to understand that um, the intentionality around bringing them through this pipeline, through this pathway for them to persist to the other end. Uh, that, that is great. Uh, and you'll be getting a phone call so we can have further conversation as we I would love it. continue our efforts here as well. Uh, Lieutenant Governor. Thank, thank you so much, uh, Associate Dean Smith. And we're going to go to Dean Nelson. Um, one of the very strong priorities that the governor and I have had is to nominate very diverse classes of judges. Uh, and we know that having a judicial branch that looks like our state is critical. And we've just nominated uh, 22 people to the bench, um, exactly half of them women. And uh, one of them is my general counsel, Sheree Phoenix Sharp. And uh, we're very excited about that. Um, but what can you tell us about the importance of having a diverse faculty and administration in law schools so that we can encourage uh, more diverse attorneys to join this important profession? Absolutely, Lieutenant Governor. And, and thank you to you and the governor for that intentionality with regards to having um, a diverse judicial branch because it is so incredibly important. When you think about what lawyers do and what we do as legal educators, we are training the next generation of leaders. We're, tra we're training the next generation of policymakers, of advocates, of problem solvers. And so it was incredibly important that the people who are doing the training to Associate Dean Smith's point, the teachers that, you know, the people who are doing the training is very important that they are diverse, the administrators who are working with those students on a daily basis and the student body themselves. Because when we think about our institutions, whether that's government, political, you know, politics uh, or political, or you think about, you know, educational systems, all of our societal systems, there is a greater legitimacy about those systems when they reflect the true diversity of our society. And as President Espy was speaking about, our society on a daily basis gets more global, it gets more diverse, and it's important that we are educating our students to thrive and to do their best work in those diverse environments. And so it's really important. The legal profession, unfortunately, remains one of the least diverse professions in terms of race of all of the professions. And so we're proud at UConn Law that we have a 27% student of color in our first year class, 61% uh, with regards to students who identify as female in our first year class, but there's still work to be done. Um, we have a 
four or five year history of an absolute flat line, particularly with regards to our African American enrollment of only 4%. And when you think about, again, the demographics of our state, the demographics of our country, um, that 4% uh, really was too low. And so I'm proud that we're able to increase that and we were been able to increase that up to um, 8%, 9% in this incoming class. But again, it's not just important about getting students of color here and faculty of color here and administrators of color. It's about the experiences that they have when they're here to the climate piece that Associate Dean Smith talked about. That is just as important to make sure that our students and faculty and staff are not just surviving law school, but thriving through law school so that they can be those advocates and they can bring that diverse perspective. All of us are from backgrounds and have lived experiences that inform who we are and how we approach policies and how we approach decision-making and how we approach problem solving. So it's very important that um, we have a diversity of perspectives that are approaching those problems, looking at them from their lived experiences uh, so that we are becoming um, a more equitable and a more just society. We've made great strides, again, thanks to wonderful advocates like um, you know, Judge, Judge Jackson and others, but we do have a ways to go. And so you know, it's incumbent upon us as legal institutions as we train that next um, generation of advocates and leaders that we are bringing everyone and their lived experiences and the diverse backgrounds uh, to the table and that we are nurturing that. So thank you, uh, Dean Nelson. And I really believe there's much to learn across our different sectors and environments uh, in this space. Uh, so Associate Dean Smith, coming back to you, uh, part of the work also includes extending the reach of diversity and inclusion among the leadership at Yale. Uh, School of Medicine, and we understand that you have a history of success uh, when it comes to faculty retention. So tell us about your approach at Yale and what you see as some of your greatest challenges and opportunities. And we listened with bated breath <laughs> so we can take some of those ideas. <laughs> oh, thank you so much for the question. Um, this is a passionate topic for me. Because um, I'll say that oftentimes, you know, there's this over prediction um, that we have uh, for, you know, um, all faculty and especially faculty um, from historically underrepresented backgrounds to, you know, you figure once they, um, you know, get their advanced degree and they're selected for you know, these faculty positions and you know, they just sort of go with God and they'll be fine and they'll get tenure and they'll, you know, et cetera. But um, individuals who are new to a space need shepherding. You know, they, they need um, not hand-holding, but they need, they need mentoring, exactly. And so um, again, I'll go back to what I said before, you know, they're, are so many groups that have these thousands of hours, you know, throughout their lives around the dinner table talking about what it means to be a professor, talking about what it means to be a politician, talking about what it means to be fill in the blank, but some come from backgrounds where that does not happen. So again, asking ourselves, how can we provide a surrogate, you know, or a proxy experience that can sort of um, answer to those hours, you know, that haven't happened over the course of, an, of a scholar's life. Well, uh, one of the things that I was very fortunate enough to co-lead and co-found was the Minority Mentoring Seminar at Washington University in St. Louis. And what that was is we took, um, uh, junior faculty members uh, who hailed from underrepresented backgrounds. And we took them through a year long um, experience where we talked about anything from, um, you know, how to showcase your scholarship. Uh, what does it mean to get tenure in your department? Not just tenure in general, but your specific department. What were the expectations? What are the expectations of your dean? Um, 
you know, how do you show up in a space uh, as a person of color or somebody, you know, from a background that historically has been excluded in these spaces? Because that all makes a difference when behind closed doors, somebody is making a decision about your tenure future. Um, we uh, introduced them to the provost, to the president or chancellor at, at WashU. Um, we talk to them about where the money comes from. Um, we talk to them about, um, uh, you know, what does it mean to write a book? What does it mean? You know, is it papers in your field or is it books that you need? You know, that sort of things that we have retreats. Um, we talked about how to make your teaching uh, more inclusive and more powerful. So, um, you know, we did all that, and that is what I hope to work with Dr. Nee Addy uh, on at Yale School of Medicine to do the very same thing uh, with, with our faculty at Yale School of Medicine. Dr. Addy is the Director of Diversity and Inclusion for Scientists. Uh, at um, Yale School of Medicine. And as a result of that minority mentoring uh, program that myself and Vice Provost Adrian Davis co-founded and co-led, 88% of those faculty remain retained at Washington University in St. Louis. So nobody came and poached them, uh, mm -hmm. thankfully. Um, and the majority of them earned tenure you know, which that sort of is unheard of, um, you know, at, at a place uh, like Washington University. So, um, you know, we have to, we have to again be intentional, you know, about um, shepherding, mentoring to uh, Lieutenant Governor's point, these individuals throughout their career and help support them and walk with them and not in front of them uh, as they uh, persist throughout their career. Thank you so much, uh, Dean Smith. Uh, President Espy, we're gonna go back to you because one of the core uh, areas of study at Mitchell is teaching and learning. And you even offer a certification in early childhood education something that during the pandemic, we truly came to appreciate uh, how precious those early childhood education spots are uh, because we had so many childcare centers and home-based businesses close their doors. Um, so tell us some of the key skills that you uh, find important in developing both our future teachers and also your work to also put out a pipeline of early childhood educators into our communities in Connecticut. Thank you, um, Lieutenant Governor. I mean, I, you're absolutely right what you said about um, teachers in general, but especially early childhood um, educators. Uh, it's certainly something that is um, very well respected. And uh, people I think about being on the front line of, of what's so critical to young people. Uh, one of the things that we do um, is um, one of the things I'll talk about in terms of what the college has done, our, our faculty specifically, is that they've uh, started this sort of education and rising collegiate chapter for education majors. And this chapter is sort of associated with a national model um, in line with Phi Data Kappa, Phi Delta Kappa, sorry about that, which means to prepare the next generation of teachers with a special attention focused on supporting and encouraging students of color to enter the profession. Uh, you would think that in today's society that there are plenty of uh, young people of color that are going into the teaching profession and more specifically early child, but there isn't. And I love how we've said a couple of times from different uh, panelists on this uh, and during this time about sort of the shepherding and the mentoring that, uh, mentoring that needs to happen uh, in order to sort of get people to move in a certain direction. And that's what we're trying to do here at Mitchell. A few of the key skills that we really help students with uh, in preparing them uh, for the field is functioning, helping them to think about how does it mean, to, what does it mean to function as a teacher in a multicultural environment? You know, working with students to effectively understand children with special needs. That is a growing, uh, a continuously growing part of our population in this country. 
one in five young persons will have, one in five people in general, will have some form of um, learning need or learning diversity. Helping students to be prepared in terms of working with multilingual individuals, uh, ensuring that our students are really prepared um, with skills that are critical to be in classrooms that support social and emotional learning in all areas of their teaching to students. And then also think about, you know, really working with our students to be prepared as teachers so that they're having the skills that can help uh, young people have the confidence uh, as learners and also to be able to create a sense of belonging in the community. In terms of preparing the, the pipeline, I mean, obviously our students are engaged in practicums and uh, teaching times at um, many other parts of the state. Uh, we do have a children's learning center on our campus with really old Neelio uh, method that really focuses on sort of the integration of nature. But um, what I'm really proud to say is that about 86% of uh, Mitchell's um, certified teachers actually do stay in the state of Connecticut, which is really sort of leaning into what I know the governor and lieutenant governor is having all of us focus on in terms of keeping the talent uh, pipeline here in the state of Connecticut. So, you know, there's a lot more that I could, could speak about, but I, I, I certainly think that we'll continue to uh, you know, increase the skills of our students and, and really encourage so many of our students to stay and work in the state of Connecticut. Oh, that is great, um, President Espy. And I love the way you talk about the diversity of our educators and what they need to be prepared for. It's one of the reasons I always set the table with the diversity of our education, our work, or educate our students uh, in our state, which is so critically important because we have to keep that in mind. So thank you very much. CEO Devanish, uh, community colleges offer a range of continuing education and workforce development opportunities for a diverse population of students. Can you tell us some of NCC's outreach efforts and the impacts of some of these programs on creating gainful employment opportunities for our residents? Absolutely. You know, I think, you know, it, it really goes unsaid that community colleges are really critical to the development of the state's workforce. Um, you know, I think that in this space, uh, we have always been engaged with employers um, locally and regionally so that we have, you know, a clear understanding in terms of those in-demand positions and the skill sets that are needed to fill that pipeline up for employers. Um, but one of the things that, you know, we've really focused on recently because I think it's really critical coming back um, after COVID is really the intentionality and being very strategic, um, not only in our partnerships and our engagement with employers, but also really including our nonprofit partners as well in that work. Um, we recently hosted at Norwalk um, a workforce convening, and we essentially brought together the employers, um, educators, and that's not only at the community colleges, but also our K through 12 partners as well, since we're talking about those really critical pathways. And then our nonprofit partners that are really on the front lines doing the work in terms of providing um, the wraparound support services that we know our students need in order to be successful, right? So for example, some of those organizations that are providing the childcare subsidies um, so that our um, female students can get back to work. And if they need some assistance in terms of childcare, they can get that. Um, the housing um, subsidies that are available, job coaching. Um, one of the things, you know, I think Dean Smith, you mentioned was, uh, it really is all hands on deck. Um, and I think that that is, you know, something that I really want to stress because, you know, although at the community college, we are really um, engaged in this work, we know that we can't do it alone. Um, and so it's really about convening um, all of those in this space uh, to really support students so that they can be successful getting back to work um, or even upskilling if they're deciding that they wanted to shift from uh, one career pathways to another career pathways. Uh, we recently piloted um, an accelerated program because we know we're hearing from employers that there is this demand um, and they need 
you know, workers as soon as possible to fill some of these critical positions, especially in healthcare, our hospitals are really struggling. Um, and so, you know, we've been meeting and hearing directly from them, what are those positions that you need filling? What are the skill sets? And then using our nonprofit partners to help in the recruitment, um, and then providing the workforce training. So we were able to get a grant um, through the Department of Labor, uh, Strength Means Community. It's a five-year grant for $2.3 million. It involves five community colleges, really to build capacity for some of these accelerated programs. Um, so we've done it, for example, in our CNA program, um, our medical assistant program. And so, you know, we know that that is really making an immediate difference because we see the job placement rates. Um, going into some of these um, uh, kind of convenings, what, we, what we're looking for employers is really to commit to, you know, a job as soon as these students finish. Um, and they are certainly up for the task because they know that they have a need as well. 85% um, of the students that went through the accelerated CNA program, um, after they passed their um, credentialing exam, they immediately had employment. So it's certainly making um, a big impact. Uh, we continue to, to utilize our community partners to identify um, those kind of populations that may need some additional support um, or displaced workers due to the pandemic. Um, and so I think, you know, one of the things that we've really been focused on again is really collectively coming together and being very intentional and very strategic about our workforce development partnerships. Thank you so much, uh, CEO Devanish. And I wanna thank all of our uh, panelists for their very thorough responses. Um, we've been so fortunate to have you all participate with us. Um, but before we close, since each of you are trailblazers and leaders, I wanna ask each of you to provide some words of advice for black women pursuing leadership roles in education. And since many of you are either the first black woman or even the first black person to be in your role, we are excited to hear your words and pearls of wisdom. Uh, so President Espy, let's start with you. Great, thanks Lieutenant Governor. Uh, just a couple of things that I was thinking about is like be yourself, um, be authentic, celebrate your individuality, um, be kind as a leader, uh, even if you're not in leadership and, and, and uh, thinking about doing it. Our society, as we all know, needs a little more kindness. Um, be a service to other, others, find out who needs help and do it, and then be fierce. Be unstoppable and all of the above, and then always, always seek out a mentor. Awesome. I'm sure folks are listening and hopefully taking notes. Thank you, President Espy. Associate Dean Smith, what about you? Oh my gosh, I love this too, this topic <laughs> too. Um, you know, as somebody, you know, from the South side of Chicago, growing up in a, a one bedroom apartment with five people, um, you know, just having all kinds of educational journeys. And, you know, I've achieved everything that I've ever wanted in my career. I want to say and encourage anybody within the sign of my voice that if you can dream it, you can achieve it, full stop, full stop. Uh, also, um, I want to say that, um, you know, in terms of the recruitment of individuals in education, in STEM, whatever, whatever area uh, of education, um, the relationship comes first. So build a relationship with the individual that you're targeting your program to or your efforts to and the people that they love and that they trust, build that relationship and then show them how you can support them on the other end and they will come, they will come. Um, but yeah, I just have to say ditto to what Dr. Espy said. Um, you know, just, 
and also women who've achieved some things tell your story you know to others who reach back and get somebody else that should be a part of your leadership is to go back and get as many as you can um, to to bring them alongside you i created something called the testimonies project which i won't go into but it's black women telling the stories of their achievement to encourage other women uh, of color to achieve uh, senior leadership roles and really any other role. So that was more than what you asked for, but <laughs> there. No, no, I love that, uh, Dean Smith. Uh, and I will tell you that I think back to the first kitchen table gathering when I first ran for public office uh -huh. and the six people around the kitchen table were all women and um, three of those women uh, went on to run for office and win themselves. And my message to other women who wanna be in politics is here's my story. If I could do it around my kitchen table, you can too. So I, I love That's the way you said that. Um, so we are gonna go uh, to CEO Devonish. What are your pearls for? Our students? I'll say um, maybe two things. Um, always be courageous um, and never be afraid to ask for help. Um, one thing that I often say here, people will hear me say it, is I'm not looking for allies, I'm looking for accomplices. Someone who is willing to stand on the front line besides me, um, beside me, and should it ever come to that time to stand ahead of me? Because, you know, I think oftentimes as um, a black woman in a leadership position, I think there is this, um, this kind of perception. I think sometimes we joke and say it's the unicorn, like you can do it all, you can do, you know, it's all about black girl magic. Um, but sometimes you need help and you always need a support network. Um, and it's okay to rely on those accomplices and those in your support network. So um, be courageous and when you need help, never be afraid to ask for it. Oh, and can I just say uh, um, this, that in politics, you always have to ask. You always, always have to ask for help um, and ask for support. And to me, what is always amazing is if you only have the courage, and I think I just heard that word, if you have the courage to ask, you will be amazed at what people will do to help you. So I am a person who always thinks that um, you can achieve what you want, but you have to ask for help consistently and persistently along the way because people will want to invest in your success. Yes, that's, that's great. Uh, thank you very much. Dean Nelson? Well, I agree with everything that everyone has said and only a couple of things to add. One is I would say tap yourself. Oftentimes, if we sit back and we wait for others to tap us and say, oh, you should apply for this or have you thought about this? Oftentimes, they overlook us. And so have confidence in yourself and in your own skill set. And don't think that you have to have checked every box. We have other people who, you know, will apply even if they have one box checked. <laughs> and we as women, and we as women of color and people of color, oftentimes if we don't have every single one of those box checks or we don't think that we do, we won't apply. But what we have is ourselves and we have the great skill set that we have been developing over our lifetime and over our careers. And we are assets and we are resources because of the perspectives we bring. So don't wait for someone to tap you. If you're interested in something, tap yourself, reach out to others that are in those positions to get that mentorship and develop sponsors. So I think sponsors are very important and they are different from mentors. Sponsors are people who will speak your name when you are not in the room, who will nominate you for opportunities. And the way that you develop those sponsorships is again, you reach out, you ask for help, you reach out to someone in a position that you would like to be in and offer to you know, take them to lunch just to hear their story, to hear their pathway. And Lieutenant Governor is absolutely right that oftentimes people will 
will be more than happy to help you along your way. And so I would just say that tap yourself. Um, any, anytime you may be discouraged, know that you're not defeated. Um, leadership can be lonely. It can be tough. It can be extra tough for women and extra tough for women of color and leaders of color. But you do have that support system that you can draw on and know that you are there for a reason. And be sure to take self-care, right? Be sure to take care of yourselves as you are going through the process, as you're in these roles, so that you can be your best authentic self uh, for the people who you are so blessed to be able to serve. My goodness, I love that. And I just uh, would add this. Um, when you're thinking about whether you should take that leap of faith, take that big step, ask yourself, uh, what would a man do in this situation? The man would not wait to check those five extra boxes. Often I'll say, I'll hear from a woman, well, okay, if I were gonna do that, I'd have to go back to school and get another degree. And I always say to them, no, no, a, a man would never do that. A man would just say, hey, I'm ready because. So um, I love what all of you uh, ladies have said and uh, Commissioner Russell Tucker, uh, you are our resident leader in education here in the state of Connecticut. And if you thought you were gonna get out of this panel without providing some uh, words of uh, wisdom, you are mistaken. So we're gonna let you uh, have the parting words here. <laughs> Thank you, Lieutenant Governor. And you made it, give me the hardest job because for all the things that were already said, you know, the mentor, the sponsor, you know, tapping yourself, all of that, were things that I was going to share, you know, so I, I would just add with saying, you know, when you find your passion, stick with it, right, you know, just, just stick with it and, and do uh, your level best. Yes, there would be discouragement, all of those things along the way, but when you know that you know, right, that this is where you are and this is where you belong, uh, you just continue to, to go at it. Uh, the mentor, we've talked about that's critically important. The sponsor, the person that's going to make sure your name is dropped in the right places, yeah. uh, really critically important. And so I wish we had time just to talk about that. Maybe that's the next thing we'll convene to talk about so we can share our testimony and our, our stories. But this has been such an awesome time together. I know this is recorded and I hope that this can be shared uh, in, in spaces with our students and, and just other women just wanting some inspiration uh, from this kind of a conversation. So thank you very much for allowing me, Lieutenant Governor, to be part of this and for, with this dynamic women. Absolutely. So to our panelists, thank you all uh, so much for sharing your insights. That has just been incredible. We appreciate it. And to all of the folks who have joined us, thank you. And uh, just keep an eye out because the Council on Women and Girls is going to be continuing with our series of panels of women leaders. So we will keep you informed about uh, the next uh, forums that will be in the pipeline. And um, thank you, as always, to our general counsel, Sheree Phoenix Sharp, for helping us put this together. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.